and welcome to Best of the Day. I'm Dr. Christy Russell from the University of Southern California, and I'm at the 2013 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, obviously in San Antonio. And I'll be doing four different interviews uh, based on some of the best abstracts that are being presented at the meeting. And uh, they will be grouped in different groups. And the first um, that I'm going to talk about are the HER2 positive abstracts. And I'm quite fortunate that Dr. Eric Weiner um, has agreed to do this interview with me. And Eric is professor of medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School. And he is the director of the uh, women's cancer program at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I think I'm close. You're close. Okay, it's fine. fine. Okay, great. Thank you again for joining me. Happy to be here. There are four different abstracts this morning in the, in the session revolving around HER2 positive breast cancer. And the first one was presented by Martine Picard on the update of the Neo Alto trial. So can you walk us through that trial and then talk about the data that she showed? Sure. Well, just to take a few steps back. In the ideal world, NeoAlto would have been done two or three years, it would have been started two or three years before the ALTO trial was right. started. Um, they were started at about the same time. Had that been the case, if it had been started in advance, we might have designed ALTO somewhat differently. But in any case, NeoAlto was a study um, in which women with HER2 positive breast cancer who were going to receive neoadjuvant therapy um, were randomized to one of three arms. And they received either trastuzumab, lapatinib, or a combination of trastuzumab and lapatinib. And if I remember correctly, there was a run-in period of the biologic agents alone, and then they were given the bio same biologic agents with paclitaxel. Um, there were research biopsies that were done, um, and the endpoint was, in fact, pathologic complete response in the breast. And this was presented by Jose Bazelga here in San Antonio, I believe, in 2010 or 11. Um, and what he demonstrated at that time uh, was that the combination of trastuzumab and lapatinib and paclitaxel led to just about a doubling in the pathologic complete response rate. And that made a lot of people extremely encouraged about what the results of, of uh, ALTO would be. So what they did um, was to actually, within NeoAlto, look at long-term outcomes. Um, and it's worth pointing out that in the adjuvant portion of the treatment, women continued to receive the same treatment that they received in the neoadjuvant portion. So they received an anthracycline, and then they went back on either trastuzumab, lapatinib, or a combination of trastuzumab and lapatinib. For one year? For, one, for a total of one year, standard duration of, of therapy, exactly. Um, and I think that everybody has to recognize that this is totally underpowered to look for a difference in disease-free or overall survival. ALTO enrolled approximately 8,000 patients, if I remember correctly. This trial had fewer than 500 patients in it. Now, what was presented was that there was not a statistically significant difference in disease-free or overall survival. I think the one interesting aspect was that among patients with estrogen receptor negative tumors, there was the suggestion of a difference between patients who received paclitaxel, trastuzumab, and lapatinib compared to those who simply received paclitaxel and, uh, and trastuzumab. And we'll see how that plays out, but that would at least suggest to me that there is a moderate chance that in ALTO, either that the entire trial will be positive or that in women with estrogen receptor negative HER2 positive disease, that dual targeting will be better than trastuzumab alone. And of course, we now know that lapatinib alone is probably not as good as trastuzumab, so that's no longer of interest. Right, and that's been removed from the ALTO trial. Quite that was some removed time from ago. the ALTO trial near the end of the trial. Okay. Um, based on accumulating data from both other studies and from an analysis of the ALTO trial itself. So in the United States, we recently got the approval for pertuzumab um, in this sort of neoadjuvant situation to be used with trastuzumab and a taxane. 
yes. uh, formulated chemotherapy. Can you put that in context with this? Sure. I think there have been, an, I don't think, I know, that there have been a lot of discussions after that accelerated approval, and there are people who agree with it and people who disagree with it. Personally, I am yet to be convinced that pathologic complete response will necessarily translate into differences in disease-free and overall survival. Um, I would have taken a different step than what the FDA chose to do, but I don't want to question the wisdom of the FDA. It's just speaking my own mind. But I think it's important to note two things about pertuzumab and the general context of that approval. So one is that in the Cleopatra trial, in the metastatic setting, there is both a dramatic disease-free survival advantage and an overall survival advantage. Right. So that gives one that much more confidence that in the early stage setting there's going to be a benefit. And number two, that a definitive adjuvant trial has already been completed. So the affinity trial has been fully accrued and asks whether adding pertuzumab in early stage patients improves outcome. So within that context, they felt much more comfortable providing an accelerated approval for pertuzumab. And then I guess the other important aspect here is that adding pertuzumab doesn't seem to add a tremendous amount of toxicity. So in their way of thinking, this was a reasonable approach um, while we await the data from Affinity. The way I might have spun it a little differently is that I think that that would have been more reasonable if they had limited the approval to a higher risk group of patients. So let's say patients with stage three disease mm -hmm. who even with standard therapy have a relatively high risk of recurrence and where you want to try to bring the, the latest and the greatest to the clinic as soon as possible. And then the one other difference in my mind um, to consider would be to, to approve it both in the neoadjuvant and in the adjuvant setting since if you define a patient who's at high risk of recurrence, in my mind it doesn't matter whether you give the therapy pre-surgery or post-surgery. So if they were comfortable approving 12 to 18 weeks of pertuzumab neoadjuvantly, I would have thought that they would have approved that same duration of therapy in the adjuvant setting. Well, we'll still have this issue with lipatinib. And, and the question I have is, are we now driving patients towards neoadjuvant therapy well, for the opportunity to get pertuzumab? Well, I, I, it, first let me go back to lipatinib for a second and say that I don't think that there's going to be an accelerated approval for lapatinib. We don't have a survival advantage in the metastatic setting for the combination versus trastuzumab alone in combination with chemotherapy. Um, and I think we're so close to a result from, from Alto that, that the FDA clearly is, is going to wait. And there is the added issue that toxicity with the combination of trastuzumab and lapatinib is not insignificant. Right. I do worry, given the way the approval um, was worded, that in fact patients who don't necessarily need to receive neoadjuvant therapy are being driven in that direction so that they can get a drug that they wouldn't be able to get post-surgery. And I'm not sure that's the best thing for patient care. Right. And we'll talk when we talk about the fourth abstract about whether these big chemotherapy regimens are uh, applicable to all patients as right. well. The second abstract was uh, presented by Sarah Hurwitz from uh, UCLA, and it was a phase two, three-arm randomized trial of neoadjuvant trastuzumab, lapatinib, or the combination, along with uh, docetaxel and carboplatin. And can you right. talk to me about that trial? So this was essentially TCH, or TCL, that is substituting lapatinib for, for trastuzumab, or TCHL. Um, and it's a relatively small study. There were approximately 40 patients in each of the arms. Um, overall, the study 
fail to see a significant difference in pathologic complete response. In fact, the three arms were dramatically similar mm -hmm. in terms of the pathologic complete response rates. Um, the authors noted that TCH appeared to be a regimen that was relatively easy to give. They specifically commented that every single patient who went on the TCH arm completed all six cycles of therapy, which I found to be um, a little surprising since usually there's at least a couple of patients who can't make it through all the way, all the way through a course of chemotherapy, but so be it. Um, but I think that there's, there's a, a little lesson here, which is that when you give all of your chemotherapy up front with anti-HER2 agents, that there's probably less of an ability to see a difference in PATH-CR. And that's important because ultimately, at least at the present, people are getting the whole course of chemotherapy. So for example, the NSABP in their preoperative trial where they also evaluated trastuzumab, lapatinib, or the combination, gave AC and paclitaxel with those drugs all preoperatively. And they didn't see a significant difference in pathologic complete response. And in the CLGB trial that we ran, we gave 16 weeks of paclitaxel. And while we saw a trend in favor of trastuzumab and lapatinib, it wasn't as marked as in NeoAlto. So I think that what it says is that when you're conducting trials and you, you want to see a signal for a better outcome with a new combination, you probably want to minimize the chemotherapy. On the other hand, if you're conducting a trial with the goal of using PATH-CR as a potential surrogate for long-term outcome, you have to give all the therapy before the surgery. Okay. So I'd not practice changing. Uh, I don't think there is anything about that study that is practice changing. Um, as was the case before the study was presented, TCH is a regimen that you could give preoperatively if, if, if that's what you choose to do. The third trial was um, the BETH trial. Um, and uh, I, since we participated in the BETH trial, I've been waiting for this trial um, to happen. We've lost essentially the use of bevacizumab for women with uh, advanced breast cancer. And this was, I think, the last gasp to see whether there'd be a role in the adjuvant settings. Well, you know, there is one more little gasp left, which is the intergroup trial that, that looked at bevacizumab. But certainly, if this is, if this is the penultimate gasp, it, um, it, 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 it didn't allow you to resuscitate bevacizumab. Right. So I think this study was resoundingly negative. Um, there wasn't... Would you explain the study? Please? Oh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, again, simple study. Um, predominantly, it looked at TCH with and without bevacizumab. There was a relatively small group of patients who received anthracycline-based therapy with trastuzumab with and without bevacizumab. But across the entire study, um, absolutely no difference in outcome, receiving bevacizumab or not. And I have to say, I think that the FDA really got it right here when they withdrew the approval. I actually think they were right when they approved it, and they were right when they withdrew the approval. And bevacizumab is just one drug in breast cancer that has turned out to be a pretty big disappointment. Um, and I don't think there's, there's much more to be said about it um, other than the fact that in this study, patients did have remarkably favorable outcomes. Um, the analysis was at a median of 38 months. Um, and in both arms, the disease-free survival was 92%. And that's pretty good, especially when you think about the fact that at least a few of those events in each of the arms are going to be contralateral invasive cancers or ipsilateral recurrences um, and are not all going to be events that are necessarily going to lead to the ultimate death of a woman from, from metastatic breast cancer. Now, compared to the pivotal trials that were presented now initially almost 10 years ago, eight and a half years ago, um, 
this is a trial that included somewhat lower risk patients. Um, almost half of the patients had no negative disease, um, and a greater proportion had ER positive disease. But still, pretty good outcomes. And you know, one of the challenges I think that we're all going to face in the next few years is as these outcomes for patients with HER2 positive breast cancer get better and better, how are we going to both maintain enthusiasm, maintain funding, um, and design studies that allow us to go from 92% to 98 or 100%? And it's a challenge. Right. You know, if we still have the dual um, trials that are, that are ALTO, as you said, and Affinity that are yet to be reported. And if this is going to be our baseline uh, outcome for just the trastuzumab with chemotherapy arm, you wonder how much better those other antibodies might be, except they have higher risk patients in those trials. They do. And then there is an there's another set of questions, and those questions relate to de-escalation of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So that better can be either preventing recurrence, but better can also be reducing toxicity and maintaining the same outcome. This is, in some ways, the situation um, we, and I say we broadly as a medical oncology community, and this is really almost before you're in my, my time, but we were in with testicular cancer 25 years ago where the outcomes were so good that the questions moved on to how can we give less. Right. And then the fourth trial, which you're intimately associated with, is um, a phase two study of adjuvant paclitaxel with trastuzumab for women with lower risk yep. early breast cancer. So this is a study that we thought about a great deal. Um, and it's a study, and I will describe it in a second, that we ran from Dana-Farber, um, but um, was um, done at a number of different centers. We had about 12 collaborating partners. We put on probably um, about a third or maybe as, uh, maybe as many as 40% of the patients in terms of this, the sites in Boston. Memorial Sloan Kettering put on a lot of patients, but we had patients coming from literally all over the country. Um, so this was a study for women with essentially, and I'll explain that in a second, node negative HER2 positive breast cancer. And the tumor had to be less than three centimeters. We did not have a lower limit. So any patient with a tumor of any size up to three centimeters could be enrolled. All patients received 12 weeks of paclitaxel at 80 milligrams per meter squared and trastuzumab at the, the standard doses. At the end of the 12 weeks, patients went on and received the completion of a full year of trastuzumab. Now, I said I would make a comment about the node negativity, and I just want to clarify that there, there was an amendment that allowed patients who had a single micromet to enroll if they had a negative axillary node dissection. There were only six patients like that. So th this is essentially a node negative trial. Now, of the patients, half of them had T1A and T1B tumors. And you know, this is often referred to as the very small tumor study. But in fact, half of the patients had tumors that were okay. between one and three centimeters. Most of those were between one and two. Um, only 9% of the patients had tumors that were between two and three centimeters. So I would really think of this as a stage one breast cancer study. Um, and I think that we really can't say that the results are applicable to, to any other group other than patients with stage one disease. About two thirds of the patients had ER positive disease, again, more than was seen in the pivotal trials. Whether that's patient selection or whether that reflects a, a difference um, in the prevalence of hormone receptors in patients with very early stage disease versus patients with more advanced disease, we, we don't know. Um, the study was set up as a straight phase two trial because we felt that there was no way that we could randomize. Right. This was 2007. Trastuzumab was the rage. There was a perception that most of these women had a high enough risk of recurrence um, that no treatment was not an option. There were all sorts of different regimens being given. And we felt that we couldn't randomize to a no trastuzumab arm. 
We also didn't feel that we could randomize one chemotherapy regimen versus another for two reasons. One is we were concerned about the toxicity of the standard regimens in this relatively low-risk population. And the other is it would have required thousands and thousands of patients to see any difference. And we just didn't feel that that was going to be feasible. And finally, while one could have argued to do a trastuzumab-only arm, it would be pretty hard to justify that. It certainly was at the time, and I think it would still be a little tough to justify. So it was set up as a single-arm phase two trial, and it was, it was designed such that we had a very high probability of declaring failure, um, which we defined as a recurrence rate greater than 9%, and a high probability of declaring success defined as a recurrence rate or a disease-free survival, invasive disease-free survival. Uh, of 95% or greater. Now, fortunately, what we saw was a result better than we would have even imagined, so it leads to essentially no real argument. Um, and in fact, there were a total of 10 disease-free survival events with 3.6 years of follow-up. The three-year disease-free survival um, was in fact between 98 and 99%. And of those 10 events, three of them were contralateral HER2 negative cancers. One was a death from ovarian cancer that arose during treatment. And six were what I would call real recurrences of HER2 positive breast cancer, two distant recurrences, and four local regional recurrences, all of which were HER2 positive. Um, and the uh, recurrence-free interval, which was a, a a unplanned analysis um, was essentially 99% at three years. And in our view, what this means is that for the majority of patients who have stage one breast cancer and for whom a decision has been made to give trastuzumab and chemotherapy, we're not saying that everybody has to get trastuzumab and chemotherapy. There are patients with T1A lesions, many patients with T1A lesions, who should not be treated at all, at least at this point in time in, in, in my mind. But if a decision has been made to give trastuzumab and chemotherapy for the patient with stage 1 disease, this in my mind is the regimen that one should very strongly consider. There are going to be patients um, where some doctors will feel compelled to give either ACTH or TCH. And let's imagine a 35-year-old woman with a 1.9 centimeter high-grade uh, tumor that's estrogen receptor negative where there's diffuse lymphovascular invasion. I think that's a patient where many, many oncologists um, would choose to give one of the standard regimens. And in truth, our study had a very, very small number of such patients. But for the majority of patients with stage one disease, this is a regimen that people should think about. And I think there is one other implication, which is that we're not gonna do a lot better by adding additional biologic agents on top of paclitaxel and trastuzumab. We don't need to be adding on pertuzumab here. Um, but this is a reasonable backbone to use, or not so much a backbone, this is a reasonable regimen to use as a control arm in looking at newer regimens like pertuzumab and trastuzumab alone. Right. So if we were to design an all biologic regimen, I think it's fair to benchmark the recurrence rate from, from this trial. Are there other trials that have been designed or have run or we're waiting to hear from that have similar data or similar numbers of patients that are trastuzumab plus X therapy? Not really. You know, so there, there have been attempts to do this, and there were attempts in the cooperative group to look at trastuzumab and lapatinib, um, but they really haven't gone anywhere to my knowledge. There have, of course, been multiple retrospective analyses of patients with either stage 1 or, or um, T1A, T1B, and 0 patients. And what those studies suggest is that for patients who have T1A and B tumors that are untreated, the risk of recurrence is probably somewhere in the range of 7 or 8 to 20%. Um, 
and across patients with stage one disease, more like 10 to 30 percent. So I, I do think that although it's problematic to compare to historical controls, I don't think we have a choice here. And I think this kind of result suggests that we really are doing better than the historical controls, and at the same time, that we're not going to do a lot better with anything else. Right. We do need more follow-up. Two-thirds of the patients had ER positive disease. They tend to have somewhat later recurrences. We expect that the recurrence rate will go up a little over time. That said, for these patients with HER2 positive, ER positive disease who have late recurrences, I'm not sure that the chemotherapy regimen you give up front will make a difference. Right. I, I don't know, but I'm just raising that issue. So we'll see. But for us, this was uh, more than we had hoped for, and we, th we think it's good news for, for patients. Well, congratulations on completing the study. It's much larger than I had thought that it was originally going to be in terms of number of patients. So well, thanks. I, I think this will be practice changing for all of us. Thanks. Thank you for speaking with me today, and I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Eric Weiner on the HER2 positive uh, best abstracts from the 2013 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. And please um, join me for the three other intervals that I'll be doing while I'm here in San Antonio. Thank you.